everybody. I'm Captain Tommy Scoble, and you are on the lifeboat. What's happening? You guys know uh, this woman. This is uh, Relatable Reese. And uh, if you're brand new to the lifeboat, maybe you haven't seen Reese over here before, but uh, most of you are probably coming from Reese's channel, where we joke around a lot. We spend an awful lot of time joking around. And one of the reasons is because Reese has kind of been um, interviewed to death concerning Scientology. But during a conversation we had the other day, I said, you know, there's a lot of questions that I wish other people had asked you. And we sort of uh, started down that rabbit hole. And I think it's uh, I think it's something that might be fun. What do you think, Reese? I love the idea. You know? And, you know, I don't think I actually disagree with you. I don't think I've been interviewed to death. I, I hardly talk about Scientology. So I'm I just looking meant that all the good ones have done it. <laughs> Oh. I guess that's what I meant. I, I guess I meant all the good interviewers have already done this, but I, I well, not yet because you haven't done it yet. I think this will oh, be um, a nice thing to say. I think uh, I actually I was saying on my channel earlier. I'm I think I'm most excited about this one, Tommy, because I'm so comfortable with you, and um, we typically kind of joke around a lot and are silly, and I kind of like this idea of us. Uh, deep diving into unknown territory. I like the idea that we, uh, that we started out um, really because it's going to, I think it's going to make this easier, you know? Now I think 99.9% .9 of people who, uh, who watch either of our shows probably have a pretty decent idea of, I don't want to rehash a lot of stuff that most people know, but if you could give the two minute that's about all the background I, I think that we need on the, uh, I want to ask questions a lot less about the, chron the chrono chronological, give us the, the, uh, a little two minute history of your upbringing and then, and then I'm ready to roll. Okay. Um, so I was born and raised in Scientology guys. I'm 39 now. So I was in Scientology until I was 38. I was raised by my father. My mother left when I was six. Um, and I, she chose not to be a Scientologist. Therefore, I was not allowed to see her. So I did not really, I saw her a couple of times, but I did not see my mother again until I was 18. I have a sister that is four years older. And um, we were in what's called the cadet org at the age of seven. So I was taken out of school and put into the Scientology Sea Organization for Children in Clearwater, Florida. Um, my father was extremely um, serious and heavy about Scientology, practicing it all the time. I've had thousands of hours around the clock uh, with the workings of Scientology and just how serious he took it. Um, so, I, um, And then I practiced it as an adult. I was taken out of school uh, ninth grade and put into recruited to be on staff at the church in Kansas city. And, um, I was on staff for two years and then I, as an adult practice uh, continued and, uh, donated a lot of money and, um, married a Scientologist and my whole life has been Scientology. When you're a Scientologist, I was saying this in a, on a podcast I did yesterday, you, your dentist is a Scientologist, your plumber is a Scientologist, you know, you're very surrounded um, it's, it's, it's by design that you are carefully not to associate with anyone in the outside world. So, um, everybody I knew was a Scientologist and that's really the only kind of people you trust. So, um, it's just been, I've been out for a year and three months now and it's quite the change just living life now and not having to live by those rules and, um, raising a child, uh, outside of it now and not practicing. And I go to therapy, which is huge as a Scientologist. Therapy is like the worst thing you can even, you can't even really talk about the word therapy. So I do that now. And that has made a huge difference. It really helps me with my son, with myself and unlearning, unpacking, not practicing anymore. Um, so I have a YouTube channel and that's just kind of been my, my journey. And the goal is to talk about healing, talk about things that are safe to talk about. And we've, we've grown quite a few people who've, you know, come to us and we have a lot of friends and family now who I'm really proud of that because it's, it's a safe place and we can talk about anything and there's no shame there. I mean, if, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly embarrassed daily 
I'm trying not to use the word dumb anymore, but I'm switching to the word naive for everyone. I'm very embarrassed daily by the things that I don't know. Um, I always say I thought Philadelphia uh, was a state. I know nothing about geography. I just basic, basic, basic stuff. There's a lot of things I don't know. And it's, uh, it's embarrassing, but I share it all the time. I'm, you know, I don't hide anything. I love else. that. I love that. Like I love that you share that honestly, because that, <clears throat> that's how you heal through anything. But I'm jumping, I'm jumping off of the order that I wanted to, uh, to do this in because, because of what you just said. Um, <clears throat> oddly enough, Moscowville, um, almost all of the Scoville women in my, uh, let me rephrase that. All of the Scoville women in, in uh, my family are teachers, right? And they're educators, like they've dedicated their entire lives to this. It's, it's something that is a passion with, uh, with all uh, people in my family. My mother, who has been a teacher for, if I told uh, anybody how long I might be beat at a later date, right? But she has been teaching longer than she claims she's been on this planet. And she's fascinated because so often you, um, Aaron, a lot of other people will say, I'm uneducated. I grew up in a cult. And I, I threw out, I said, Hey, I'm doing an interview tonight. I said to Johnny, you got any questions you oh. want to throw at her? I said to my mother, you got any? I got to pause you for a minute, Tommy. Everybody's saying your mic is not on. My mic is not on. I hate it. I hate cutting you off because I was really into what you were saying, but they're saying they can't hear you. They say you're very quiet. Well, isn't that something? Cause my mic is on. Tell you what, we cranked it. I hope I hope that, uh, that better. We get a five by five. Oh, see, and I, everyone else is saying I hear them. You know what it is, sadly? Yeah. I'll, I'll, what, what it is is that, that every once in a while, for real, they just know that if they can get Tommy to stop talking about whatever he was talking about, that he's never going to get back to it. Honest. Okay. Sadly. Okay, well, let's go back to that because I'm really... Tell me what it was because I was really loving it. Okay, I know I was too. It. It's your about everybody in your family being teachers, and then us. Uh -huh. So we're not so smart. Moscowville. So Moscow. I, I I said to the family, I said, you know what, I'm doing an interview tonight, and the, everyone who's ever interviewed anybody in Scientology, it didn't necessarily mean you, but second gens. There's a, a bazillion interviews out there with every second gen, and and questions tend to get recycled, and for obvious reasons, you got to kind of go with the assumption that the people who are listening may not have heard, you know, other things, but. My mother is fascinated by the fact that you can, you say things like, you know, you're uneducated. You do not sound even remotely uneducated. Now I'm a public speaker, right? By training. And I said the same thing, right? Now a teacher has said the same thing. And I, I hear this from a lot of people. And I think what you mean is <clears throat> your education was different, but Moscowville's question was this, um, without formal education, how did you uh, develop the communication skills that you have? Because damn, you know, you sound like you've been to college to, to most educators. So there may be some stuff on geography or whatever, but where did the other half of the education come from? If there was nothing there, how do you get that? I know that like uh, autodidactic, right? Like self-taught, but what, how does this take place? If she really did say that, I just want to tell her, thank you. That's a really kind thing I to say. Lie. That's a, that's a, I don't lie. Well, I, I don't so mean it like, it. I'm not implying that you lied. I just mean, if that really was a question from her, I appreciate that. And I think that's really it sweet. Really and I, really I is. think she sounds adorable. Um, I, um, I would say I, uh, Scientology does a lot, a lot, a lot. I've from as early as I can remember doing training on communication drilling, drilling, drilling all the time. Um, and so I'm sure, right. Like I, I would guess you learn how to acknowledge, you learn how to, the, the, the cycle of communication and Scientology is what we're taught. Um, there's so many different training routines. That's what they call TRs that you go through and, and mm -hmm. to really become a well-rounded communicator. Now I, don't know that I would honestly say, I'm just trying to think of all my training and, you know, the person going, do birds fly? Yes. Good. I'll give you that again. Do birds fly? I mean, how is that making it? I mean, I know a lot of Scientologists that are not good communicators and we all did the same thing, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Right. So, um, I don't know that it comes from that. I, I, I think it has maybe to do with the fact that I've always been, very interested in people. I love talking to people. So it may just come from that. I have no back off or fear on, you know, 
communicating with people. I like to hear people's stories and where they came from. So maybe Tommy, it just comes from that, you know, just being truly curious and interested in conversations. I'm very social. Right. The, uh, you said at ninth grade, there was a change. So what was the, the, what was your, your education to ninth grade? Cause I was, I was jotting this down. You said at ninth grade, you left. Take me back I to was, that again. I was recruited, uh, after completing ninth grade, I just completed ninth grade in the summer. Um, I was recruited to go down to the church. I, I Debt was born and raised in Omaha. I'm from Omaha. Kansas city is a three hour drive. Um, so I was recruited to go down. My father bought me a big package to go do a bunch of um, auditing and training that summer. And the intention was for me to finish up, complete all of that package and go back to school. And while I was there, my dad stayed in Omaha and the people I stayed with were on staff and recruited me for staff. And I was 13. I was turning 14. My birthday is July 8th. So that was right in the middle of it. I was turning 14. This is another thing that <clears throat> I know that on, uh, on others, uh, others have talked about um, the fact that Scientologists believe that you're a fully formed adult. Yeah. You're as a Thetan, you're not, you're not a child. Yes, there are no kids. They're just um, big beings in small bodies. And this is one of the things that, um, and I'm bringing this up uh, because it, it was brought up recently. I don't want to rehash the guy and bring up any of that, right? But you were uh, you were in a relationship early on with a guy that was considerably older than you, right? You were. He was uh, twenty four. I was fourteen. He was twenty four. Right. Um, <clears throat> inside the Sea Org, this was considered completely normal as hell, right? There was nothing unusual about this, or right. This is considered. Well, it's considered because normal because we are all the same age. It's believed that we are all 76 trillion years old. So yes, to answer that question, yes, it's, it's, nobody's treated as a child. You do not, I mean, that's pretty offensive to treat someone like they're a child. All right. I got a question for you. When they say to you, so we're going to, we're going to pull you out of school and we're going to bring you down to the cadet or what, what goes through a nine? you know, a ninth grader's mind when that happened. Well, well, hold on. You're kind of confused. Um, let me explain to you. I was pulled out of school when I was seven and put into the cadet org. Okay. Oh, I got you. Sorry. So I was pulled out of public school when I was seven and shipped to Clearwater from Omaha uh, with my father and my sister. We all joined the Sea Org. Okay. And that's, that's the, the biggest organization in Scientology. Okay. So um, I was pulled out of after ninth grade when I was turning 14, I was put on staff at the regular, we call it the org, the organization. I was put on staff at the Kansas city church org. So two different things. The cadet org was when I was seven, that was way okay. different than being on staff. Right. So when you were on staff, were you living uh, on premises or were you uh, going home? Going home to Omaha? No, I mean, there's free staff and then there's people who live there, correct? There's staff that show yeah, up. Yeah, so the Sea Org, that's what I mean. It's totally a different thing. The Sea Org has uh, like birthing where they all live. Um, it's usually like 10 to 12 to a Dorms room. almost, yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, totally different situation. Um, staff, you're going home. Yeah, you have an apartment, you have a home. You work about 16 hours a day and then you go home. Excellent, that's what I was trying for. So, because I find this fascinating. There is so much talk about disconnection right? For really obvious reasons. And we'll touch on just how bad the disconnection was and how fast. But before we do that, I think very often we don't have a clue what connection looks like, right? Because as people who have never been in this, I got a pretty good idea what connection looks like to me and the people that I, that I live in and the world that I live in. What was it like before disconnection? I have, I have a tough time wrapping my brain. Like you said, you, you go to the dentist, you're going to a dentist who's a Scientologist, right? You go here, you're going. So you're, you're in this, you're, you got a foot in both worlds, but you're not really in the, the same world that we're in out here, are you? Oh, God, I mean, did no. you know anybody that wasn't sci a Scientologist? No, not adult. I mean, when I went to public school, uh, of course, teachers, things like that, but I had no existence in school. I mean, I went to school and then I went home and studied Scientology. My dad had me drilling Scientology all hours of the day outside of school. 
So, so connection was just the people within, I mean, you were disconnected from the rest of the world, but connected to every Scientologist. Absolutely. That was the only, yes, that's the only safe place. You know, we're told as Scientologists, the outside world is not a safe place and you do not trust non-Scientologists. This has always fascinated me. If, If we're not trustable, how do you convert us? You follow me? Like, how, how does the how does the process of of saddling up to somebody that is dangerous as hell? It, it, you know, I know that you start with the uh, come take the personality test, but it you is you find their ruin. You find what's called their ruin. Like, um, I'm married now, and it's very frowned upon to be a Scientologist and get married to a non Scientologist. It's highly frowned upon, and it was no different there when I got married, and um. I was told many times, like, as long as you, we switch him and he becomes one and he's got the money, you know, they, they check all into that. Um, but the first thing you do it, see, I think the reason is you have kids and you, they're born and raised. It's so much easier. Right. So when you find somebody that isn't, and you got to convert somebody like Jeff, who's a Methodist, you, um, you find what's called their ruin. And so when you go to take that personality test or you sit down and do the the test on the e-meter, that's what they're doing. And what their ruin is, is let's just say someone says, well, uh, they get, they get you talking and they say, well, so, you know, think of a moment, you know, you're on the meter and they're teaching you what it, the needle's doing. And they go, think of a time, you know, that maybe you were really sad. They're just trying to keep it light. And somebody may say, well, I lost a child. And then they really dig their claws into that and they get you to cry and they get you to be upset. And then they get you to, back up on, you know, back to present time. And then they go, now that's what we can do for you. That's just a slight, you know, they get you feeling better about it after your good cry. Um, it's pretty sick. And that's what they do. And so when I married Jeff, they were like, we got to, we got to get his ruin. You need to get his deepest ruin. What is that ruin? I mean, they were telling me to do that. Uh, that is, uh, it's just so sick and bizarre to me. And at the time it feels completely normal, right? This doesn't feel like, uh... it's all I knew. All right. So your job when you were working uh, at the uh, at the org, what were you doing? I was in the section of the organization that's um, basically Aaron calls it the HR division because it's easier to put it that way. It was the division that had to do with ethics, um, people getting in trouble. Um, it's a higher uh, you know tier. Not just anybody can be in it. It's called HCO, the Hubbard Communications Office. Okay. I've said many times on the, uh, on the boat and I've said it on your channel that there, I don't get judged by second gens. It's a very odd thing. When they find out I'm a bank robber, there's nothing to that. And I think that there's a synergy of some sort. And I think part of it is because we kind of do, we kind of had escaped right from something. We kind of were incarcerated. I think there's something similar to that. Um, believe it or not, there are times I miss it. As bizarre as that might sound to everybody in the real world, there are days that there will be something about that hell hole that I was inside of that I think, you know what? As crazy as that sounds. Do you ever miss any of it? Just the people. Because you'll joke from time to time and say, my Scientology was really hanging out. Think yesterday, for instance, right? Did it feel like you were uh, like you were back in there and flexing a little? Oh yeah. Did it feel good? No. Okay. I always, um, I always disagreed with so many things I saw, and one of them was the screaming, the yelling, the force, the throwing things, the physical, just harming people. I never thought it was right. The racism, um, you know, everybody is told in Scientology to hate gay people. I always disagreed with all those things. So there's not a lot that I miss. And when my Scientology, you know, is showing, I say it jokingly, but I'm super ashamed. Right. One of the things that freaks me out is um, I spent a whole lot of time as a criminal. Right. And I'm not comparing the two, but I'm comparing two lifestyles that are so different from one another. It's insane. The life that I lived prior to 
you know, the age of 46, I really, really had a very, very drastic uh, change. And I remember waking up on the 27th of June and going, holy shit, my entire life has been a waste, right? Everything that I've done up to this point, I got to throw out the window today and start from scratch. Now, it had to be a lot easier for a bank robber to say that. What was it like, right? That, that moment where you go, holy crap, literally everything I've built my entire life on is horse crap. Um, well, that was the hardest part for me. I don't do depression that I'm aware of. I mean, I don't, if I feel super sad about something, I always, it lasts a, you know, a day or two. And then I kind of pull myself out of, it's just not natural. I'm, it's not a place for me to hang around in. And, um, that was the hardest part. That was when I was outed and lost, you know, close to about 500 people in 24 hours that I'd known since I was born. Um, that was probably the darkest time for me. I could not, I, I, I had never experienced not being able to get out of bed, for instance, or just being super tired, not wanting to do anything, not wanting to take care of my son. Like I just had a really dark time of this isn't uh, going to get better. And super, super low. It was a really hard time for me. And up until that point, right, do they not sort of beat a doctrine that if something crappy is happening, you brought it into yourself? So with all of this happening at that time, is that something? I mean, how do you how do you go 100%. from believing that how do you go from believing that if I stubbed my toe, it's because I somehow brought that into me to then having your world explode without you going, oh, this is all my fault. Well, I just did that up to like two months ago. I mean, that's why I go to therapy. I, every time something, ha I was just saying this in therapy, this is so new for me when something bad happens now, whether it be, you know, a relationship go bad or something physical, like you injure yourself or get sick just up till like maybe 10 weeks ago, I find myself, you know, I slammed my finger in a drawer in the kitchen the other day. And typically I would go, God what did I do? I'd start racking my brain. What did I do? Like, who did I, did I, who did I, did I do something to myself? Did I lie? Did I, you know, so I don't do that anymore. And I was so excited when I realized that day, I was like, oh my God, I broke that habit. I don't do it anymore. I don't even think about it. How about the tone scale? Right. Isn't there a thing called the tone scale? I don't use it anymore. You... No, but I mean, how does, the... so I'll give you an example, right? I get in the car. And the first thing I do is I check to see if there's anything around me that looks like it might be painted in black and white because I, for so long in my life, I broke the law. So when I get into a car before I put the key in it, I look around for cops and it's, I'm probably going to do it for the rest of my life. I got pulled over twice since, uh, since not being a criminal. And when the cop pulled up the second time, I would check this out and I put my hand up and showed them. He's like, what's wrong? I said, I've been a criminal my whole life. I'm, t I'm terrified that you're here. There's nothing in my car illegal. You can search it. I'm completely clean. I'm terrified because I spent my whole life trained. You follow me? Of how do you, is it, is how difficult is it to say, okay, you know what? That doesn't work. This doesn't work. All of these things. I mean, you, you were trained, right? For a really long time. Yes. The only difference between you and me there, I actually feel bad for what you just said. I don't have those environmental reminders anymore. I am not associated with anything in Scientology. So I don't get pulled over and you know what I mean? I'm not close to yeah. it. The closest I got was I went to, well, flag recently. I went to uh, Clearwater, as you, as you know, you were there. Um, and I went to, that was hard, but right like a week or two before that, I went to the Kansas city org. I went down there and stood in front of it and I couldn't stop shaking. I mean, it was just, um, really kind of traumatic for me. And I was so scared. I mean, I was just like barely able to make it up to the pavement. I was so scared because that's close to home for me. If somebody were to walk out of that building, I'm going to know who they are. Those 500 people that disconnected from me are all in Kansas city. So when I get close like that, like you explained with your example, that's when I, you know, feel it. But lucky for me, I am totally detached. There's nothing, there's, there's nothing in my environment anymore, which is a good thing, right? It helps me to heal faster. 
I'm glad you brought up the uh, the um, the org visits, right? Because I've watched the first one that you did. I watched the Kansas City one, and uh, and then I happened to be there for uh, one of the days that uh, that you were down in uh, in in Florida. I don't know I was there for both the days that you were down there in Florida, uh, or two of the three, something like that. Um, you're different than other people while you're out there, and if if anybody paid attention, right? I'm not telling you anything that you didn't see if you were watching it. You're different. Um, your reaction to people is different and I'm fascinated by it. Do you know what I'm talking about or do I need to highlight? No, why I, you're different? Yeah, I don't. I'm waiting for you to explain what you mean. Okay. Um, I understand that the confrontational thing is, uh, is really kind of catching on and it's, and it's a bit hot and you would go up and talk to these people, but it, it was like, I don't know that respect is the word that I want to, because I'm not saying that everyone else is disrespectful. What I'm saying is, like you, the, the person that had the clear shirt on, you were excited for this person, right? You really were, oh, you were yeah. fired up. If somebody had just watched this from the side, they would have thought maybe you were in, right? It was, you didn't want to bust this person down. He was living the best day of his life. He thought I was and, a Scientologist. You, I told him, I, I'm, I'm excited for you to attest to the state of clear. He knew. Different. It was, it was certainly very Maybe different it's different because I'm thought. the newest one that's out. Maybe, maybe. I definitely I don't, don't want to hurt anybody though. Like I, that's maybe not that's my intention. It. I don't want to hound anybody. Um, I think Scientologists are great people. I miss them. Oh, that was, a, that was a question I was going to get to. I can't imagine what that's like. And I'm not trying to bum anyone out, but I, I, uh, I had to disconnect from my kids. I could call them. But I had to disconnect from my kids because of a uh, of a divorce, and I was a criminal, right? Which didn't help either. But the um, I can't imagine the um, how this is explained. How do you how do you talk to Hux about this when it happens? I mean, honest to God, how do you say the people that have been in your life are now gone? How, how do you make someone understand that? Uh you know, he was 13 when this all happened. I mean, it was a year ago and um, it, I really tried to shield Huxley from Scientology as much as I possibly could. I really tried to make up every excuse I could as far as, you know, people constantly were trying to get me to bring him in for services. And I would just go, you know, we just really want to respect... And it, 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 there's a thing in Scientology that you call personal integrity. It's an actual reference that L. Ron Hubbard wrote. And so it's kind of means something different than it does in the real world. And it, it's kind of something you can kind of stand firm on. And so I would use that and go, we just want him to use his own personal integrity and, you know, have his own choice on it. And trust me, we're really pushing it at home, but we want him to reach. We really want him to reach. Like I would just, you know, string it along as best as I could. And it worked. Um until it didn't. And all these people were in his life. Huxley knew these people, whether he did services or not, it was still our life. And when I um, was finally accidentally outed by Aaron, he asked me to do an interview with him after that happened. Once, once everything hit the fan and it was found out it was overnight. I mean, he, when he flashed my name up, those people were gone. And I think a couple of months went by and Aaron kept kind of calling me and saying, Hey, I I'd love to interview you. Like now that, you know, it's out and you think about it, no pressure. And I, I really had to think about it. And that was the time I took to, um, kind of share more details with Huxley about what actually happened. You know, he didn't know all of it. I kept that from him. Um, I don't know how well you've seen, I don't know if how many times you've seen Huxley, but he is super, super mature. And he's always been, I've always said this. He's like a 50 year old man since he was like five years old, getting ready for kindergarten. He gets up at like five in the morning. He eats his own breakfast. He's very regimented. He's just, he's not your average kid. And he's always, um, been somebody I kind of lean on for things. I mean, he's very smart. He's very intelligent. He thinks things through. He's not reactive. So to answer your question, it's kind of dragging it out, but um, I came to him the day before the interview. I told Aaron, I called him and I said, I think I'm ready. I think, I, I think I'm ready to talk about it. 
And first I went to Huxley and I told him everything that happened. I told him about the underage um, sexual activity that went on. It was some heavy stuff that I really shared with him. And I said, what do you think? Like we've lost everybody. You know, I, I, before I do this interview, I want your opinion on it. And he said, um, he said, I, um, he said, do you, I think he said, I think you're really smart to do this mom. He said, but I want you to think of something. Cause I said, I don't know if I should do it, Hux. And he said, you were 14. And I said, yeah. And he said, would you want that to be happening to a 14 year old girl right now? And I said, no. And he said, then you should do it because it might help somebody. And I said, sold. You'd convince me. I'll do it. I said, absolutely. <laughs> yep, that would have um, uh, done it for me too. But he is so, uh, he thinks of other people first, so much like that. And he said, if you can help one person, he was like, I think you should do it. It will expose, he said, how, how horrible. He said, I didn't know that story. And he said, it will really maybe help. He said, even one person. And so he said, you kind of have to do it. Wow. Yeah. He just gained a lot of fans on the lifeboat. Whose who's motto is we were only hoping to help sex. <laughs> that's, uh, that's really a beautiful thing. And uh, He has really struggled um, losing our family. You know, nobody yeah. said goodbye to us. And um, that was not, that was not something he was willing to put up with. Um, thank you, Spanx. I love Spanx. Um, he, um, he took it into his own hands to deal with the family that, that left us. And I thought that was really brave of him. So Huxley has dealt with this pretty head on, but it's Tommy, it's been really hard. It's like, it's like 500 deaths. I mean, we never heard there was no goodbye, nothing. These people just left. Um, well, I hope everybody is pissed off. Seriously. Because sometimes this stuff comes off as entertainment because it's just how it happens. You know what I mean? But what they're doing to people is absolutely the sickest crap on planet Earth. And you know what? I walked by. I told this story, man. But I knew how sick these people were 25 years ago. And I cracked jokes about it. My kid was three when Emmett was in my house, an OT8, and we used to do business together and my kid was three and he's 31. And you know what? I should have freaked out all those years ago. And if you know what's going on, if you eat at La Pabelle, right? If you're, if, if you watch what's going on with the LA cops or anything else, man, for real, this is a, a bunch of scumbags. I'm so glad that you're here telling this because I don't know how many people would do a better job. Uh, Reese, you have been an encouragement to me. I have had a family member recently disconnected from me. I can't even imagine what you went through. Um, stand proud, Reese. Love that. Thanks, Mary Johns. I love Mary Johns. Thank you, Cal. <clears throat> I do too. I have a question for you. So when I was growing up, um, my dad was a huge dude. He's like six four, but the world's biggest softy. And love was something that just we talked about an awful lot in my house, right? Growing up, it was just something that we spent a ton of time talking about. And very often it was tied to faith, not over the top, but certainly there were things. How is the how is the love thing explained like within the Scientology thing? Because I'll be honest, if those of us from the outside who hear about a parent that says, I'm not going to talk to you anymore, that blows us away. It's something, the disconnect thing, we go, the love of a child would be impossible to do that, right? The love of a grandchild would be impossible to do that. So for the uninitiated, it's, it's really bizarre. How is the love thing explained? Um, well, I mean, love is conditional, first of all. So it's based on your achievements, climbing up the bridge in Scientology. So it's not based on you were born and I just love you until the end of time because you're mine and you were born. It has to be earned based on, um, you know, your training and what you choose to do. And if you pull away from Scientology, you're loved less. So I think it's just based on your 
Um, I mean, I can tell, I, I don't, sp first of all, I just want to say, I don't speak for, I know there's a lot of other Scientologists with channels. I am not giving those experiences to them. These are my experiences. I don't, I can't, I don't like doing these interviews and I go, well, we're told, I mean, I was told that doesn't, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean other people were raised this way. I think my dad was particularly hateful of his children. Um, and I think there are other parents that were not. So, um, my dad, no, I can't recall a time my dad ever even touched me as far as like a hug. I mean, he was physical when he was angry, but he never touched me like to hug me. He never said, I love you girls. Um, so the love thing, I don't know what you mean. My mom left when I was six and I, I think I did a live on this once. I, my therapist said to me, do you hug people? And I was like, what is a what kind of a question? And he said, hugging is extremely powerful. Like, do you? And I said, no, I don't hug people. And he said, were you hugged as a child? And I said, have we not met? I mean, how many sessions have we had? No, I was not touched at all. And he said that, um, that's really interesting because kids need that. And he talked about some uh, study that was done like monkeys with like soft cloth around a wire mother. Okay. Something like that. And then the monkeys that were not and the difference and how they were. Um, and he said, so hugging is actually like a very powerful, important thing. So the love to answer your question. No, there was not, there was not that my father was fairly disgusted most of the time with us. And, and we were, I can't remember before four, but all I remember is um, my dad just setting us in chairs, my sister and I doing the, the, the training routines in the kitchen. And he was livid mad. And if I screwed up, you know, it was flunk. And he was like, start. Like he was just very rigid. And I, um, I don't think there was any love. There was a lot of fear. I remember sitting in that chair. I was talking about this yesterday. I kind of, there's certain things I forgot about until I start talking about it. And then I remember. Sure. And I was sitting in that chair and I remember being four or five, you know, but my sister would have been nine or 10 and he would get so angry and scream and yell if, if we didn't do it right. You know, if we weren't applying it correctly and Scientology also has a totally separate language. So it's like, a, it's oh, yeah. a language. You switch, you switch languages. Um, he would use that language. And at the age of four or five, I had no idea what those words meant. I didn't know what they meant. And so I would misapply the routine we were doing. And he would tell me to do it in that language. And I didn't know what it meant. And I remember just like, I was so freaked out. Like I was just like, he was like, you're doing it wrong and start. Like he would just scream. And I would just try so hard not to cry. And my sister was like, don't cry. Don't cry. Like it was so intimidating. And, um, so there was no love. There was no love. The, uh, sorry. Why aren't more people clamoring to get out? Can I take a shot at this one? Why what? I'm sorry. This question. Why aren't more people clamoring to get out? The uh, I worked in a, in a prison, and I was a, I ran the kitchen. I had a slightly higher education than most of the people there, so they stuck me in charge. And I would come home halfway through lunch, where the lockdown is everywhere. Every unit's locked down. And I would walk up to my unit and there would be 65 guys waiting on the outside of the unit to walk in. I would walk up, pull the door open and walk in. And the 65 guys would follow me in because I hadn't been there long enough to realize that it was okay to go up and put your hand on the door and pull on it, right? But they would stand at a open door because they are so beat down that they will not walk through a door that someone doesn't tell them they can walk through. And this is what happens to people over a long enough period of time, especially like prison, at least there's nobody literally torturing you mentally to try to, to encourage that behavior. In theory, that should not be happening in prison. I mean, it, there's some of it, but the cults are so fantastic at what they do. And if you find one that's 20 years old, trust and believe they've got it to a science, right? You find one that has endured the crap this one has, 
Um, I think a lot of people would love to get out, but sometimes the devil that you know, right? Imagine spending your whole life, like Reese just said, imagine spending your whole life being taught that people like me and you and everybody else are terrifying. They want to hook you up to electroshock machines, right? They want to do these horrific things, which, by the way, they showed you videos of. It's they're they're sneaky as shit, and I've seen the uh, the you know the the personality test. It's pretty damn innocuous, but boy, you give up a lot of information, right? It's um, I'm sorry, Reese. I thought I would get less emotional than you. <laughs> sorry, I really am. Um, you, uh, the aftermath is what really started this, correct? You eventually mm -hmm. um, saw the aftermath. Um, walk me through the realization of what that was like as you're watching this and starting to put this together and going, oh my God. The aftermath right, was, was a show, to... guys, on Netflix. Um, and it was a show. I can't remember what year it came out, but... Um, Scientologists, it's a very serious, serious thing to look in any direction um, on social media, or like Google, anything like that. So just to preface that, like you are not, and, and, and if you're, I was saying this yesterday, if you're a seasoned Scientologist, you don't even want to. You can get in trouble for standing in a grocery store reading a headline on the National Enquirer. Like you don't, you are not interested because if once you learn that you do that, you are put in so many hours. I mean, it is like a flashlight on your face of what's called sec checking, security checking. And you're put on a meter. And I mean, I'm talking hours of uh, it's torture. I'm telling you, I've had a lot of it and you got to pay for it too. It's on your dime. And, and I want to say it's like 800 to a thousand uh, an hour. I mean, it is incredibly expensive. Um, so the aftermath show came out. I am still a Scientologist. Okay. I'm the only one in my family besides my father that remained a Scientologist. My mother got out of Scientology. As I said earlier, my sister joined the Sea Org at 14 and left and never went back to Scientology. So those two had been out for a long time. Okay. Meanwhile, I'm married and I'm in a heavy Scientology family and I'm heavily into Scientology. My mother and my sister live in Nashville. I go to Nashville every summer to visit, okay? Every summer for I think two years, maybe three, they begged me to watch this show. I mean, like cornered me and it really upset me because I already looked at them as sort of enemy territory because they're not Scientologists. And we only hang out with Scientologists. So I'm kind of already trained and prepared by the church when I go. Like, so here's what you're going to do. You're going to report what you hear. You're going to you're going to stay in line. You know, and when I get back, they put me on the cans and say, so what did they say? What did they do? So I'm already like, la, 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 la. I don't want to hear anything, you know. So these two years in a row that I go, they're like, please, please, please. Let us just put one episode on. Let us just show you one. And I would say, I'm going to change my ticket. I'm going home. I cannot really? listen to this. You know, I can't listen to this and I'm going to get in so much trouble for this conversation. So I never did. And I had a friend in Kansas city when I bought this house and I had just resigned from my job and I was on the phone with her and unpacking. And she said, you know, I don't know a lot about your background. I know some things, but she said, I did watch that show and just like a friend to a friend. She said, you might want to just see if you can stomach one episode. And I said, I don't want to hear this sad crap about, you know, I was told by the church like, oh, it's just a bunch of, you know, sob victim stories, these poor people. And the church would tell me, okay, Reese, but like, think about it. You could find ex-Catholics. You could find people who were Jewish that are no longer disgruntled. People are going to say things, right? that they don't mean that that aren't true, right? To smear it. That's how I was sold on it. So um, I said that to my friend. I said, it's just, a, I said, I already have my own sad stories. I don't care about people <laughs> smearing the truth. So anyway, the point is I did watch one. I watched one episode and it was of uh, a girl who's actually up and coming. And I went to her fundraiser last week. Her name is Miriam. Oh, yeah. oh. I'm doing a show with her Saturday night at seven, actually. 
uh, for the first time we're going to meet. So um, I watched hers and I absolutely was under the impression all the things that didn't work on me, like all, all the things that happened to me, I was the only one. Like Scientology works. It just doesn't work on me is always how I thought. That was my own. They didn't tell me that. It was just my own way of thinking. You know, like it just didn't work for me because I'm just a bad person, I guess. Uh, when I watched it, I could not stop crying. I watched the first episode and then I watched the next episode. And all I could think was like, oh, my God, that happened to me. That happened to me. I, oh, my that, God, that yeah. happened to me. Yeah. So um, that's kind of how it just unraveled. And it was so I couldn't unsee it. I could not stop crying. Um and I just thought, what do I do now? You cannot go obviously in and say, I watched this. Is this true? You know, I can't go anywhere. I can't talk to anybody. So you continue to go to work, right? And then you reach out to the Aftermath. I reached out Foundation. to the Aftermath Foundation. Meet and, AA uh, Aaron Smith Levin called me back and we talked for about an hour and a half and I felt really safe and it felt so good to like voice my concerns. And, um, I told him some of my story and, um, I said, I just want out. I just want to get out. How do I get out? How can I leave without, you know, losing my family, losing everybody. And he said, I think that before you blow it all up and do that, let's see if we can help get others out. And I really liked that plan. And he said, why don't you give me all the information you have? Like, let's do that. And then maybe we can try to get people out in Kansas city. So I did that for about six months. And then as you know, he was doing a live stream on a new year's Eve and I gave him a bunch of information about my mother-in-law, who's a 40 year staff member. And he accidentally flashed it up on the screen with my name on it. And, uh, they were watching and it was, it was over. I never talked to anybody again. I hope everybody really gets an appreciation for that statement because it comes out really, really quick. But I don't know if you can imagine what that's like. It's uh, Now, my friends were not quite like your friends, but I walked into a prison knowing a very, very large number of people and fentanyl killed every single one of them but one while I was gone. Not being funny, they're all gone. And it was so bizarre to walk out and not have anybody left that I could have a conversation with, right? Nobody... Uh, but I can't imagine knowing they were 500 yards away or I could pick up a phone and call them and still not have the ability to communicate with anybody from my past. That's a um, that's another thing that um, I can't imagine uh, coming to grips with this. I really can't. And there is a, go ahead. It's just funny you say that because I always think my reaction was so weird when Aaron called me. He called me the next day to tell me what had happened. And he said, it, you know, it flashed up so fast. I edited it out. He was like, I think we're in the clear. I think it's okay. It was a quarter of a second. And as much as I, you know, I'm fairly a dramatic girl at times. I don't know if you knew. But as much as I um, would have expected to react to it, I didn't. It was so calming. I just said, if this is how I go, then this is how I go. And I hope this isn't it. But I said, you know, okay. It was just really kind of a weird reaction for me. I I get that. I, I've had reactions like that in the past. For me, three days later, I would be going, I want him dead. Was there a period of time after that where you thought, oh, this is just not how I wanted this to end? Like I would have rather maybe planned this a little different. I can't imagine. And I'm thinking just me, right? I'm not, a, I'm not necessarily a good person, but I would have some animosity. I, I'm sure I would have gotten over it, but you weren't pissed at any point. No, I wasn't pissed at all. No, I wasn't pissed at all. I was, um, I kept thinking now I wish that I could have done this on my terms. I would have never done it. That's the point. I would have never, ever, ever talked about my story. I would have never, I've never talked about any of this to a non-Scientologist. The story has never been shared. Um, so even I uh, actually, <laughs> well, I was going to say, uh, I did share some details with Jeff uh, years ago. And that was shocking. Even then I remember telling him about Shane, which was the guy when I joined staff and he said, that's statutory rape. And I said, it no, it isn't. 
And he said, oh, yes, it is. it is. And I said, no, because I consented. I said, he, no, he was my boyfriend. But that's what I'm trying to tell you. It was like, it didn't even occur to me. And he said, Reese, you cannot consent at 14. He was 24. That is absolutely no question. And I was like, no, not at all. So I don't know that, um, I just never would have shared this story had Aaron not done what he did. So I tried to look at the bright side and now I look at it as, you know, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And not because of me, not because of me, because of my child. Sure. I will. I, uh... I don't care if I die tomorrow, my kid won't, I will never have to worry I don't have to worry about him getting recruited into the Sea Org. I've always been terrified of that, that he's going to go into the Sea Org and I'm never going to see him again or that they're just going to take him. And so I can't be mad. I just can't be mad. I can't find myself to be angry at all. It's such a gift. I Damage has been done with me, but he was just at the beginning of stepping into being recruited and it's over. And I don't, it's just, I, I, I'm serious. If I died tonight, it's like, I at least know Huxley's safe. See, I saw an earlier, an early interview you did where um, you were talking about how, you know, this was your fault and it really is your fault. And I remember watching it and going, no. And, and the more I listened to it, the more that my takeaway from that was, man, if he didn't, if he didn't dox you by accident, you'd still be in. And I don't mean that 100%. with disrespect. It's, it's so never hard to break out of a situation, even if the situation sucks, right? This is what I deal with every day, all day on this channel, right? People who are in situations that are the absolute, you, you would look at situations and go, boy, they're going to be excited to get out of that. And the truth is we're always so afraid of what we don't know the next step is that we'd rather just be stuck in, in, in what we know because the devil, you know, sometimes seems safer. Right. And it answers that earlier person's question. Like, why are people not clamoring to get out? I would have never left. It would have been worth it to me to stay and suffer because otherwise the fear is I lose everybody. I lose everybody in my life. Where am I supposed to, I mean, how do I start? How, and it's not just losing everybody. It's I'm going to be kicked into the real world where it's scary and we're told it's not safe. You know, I'm going to be exiled. <laughs> So I would have never talked. Absolutely not. Never. The uh, the break-in period to us um, people on the street, I was going to use the nickname that they give us, but I know it's a slur in another country. The um, <clears throat> us bags of uneducated skin that don't realize we're Thetans, right? You, you, we were always villainized from, uh, from um, within the, uh, the cult. So getting out. And realizing that number one, we're, we're not the villains that you thought we were. How long did it take before you started to, uh, to number one, realize that these people really are maybe not so bad? And before you started to be able to trust, because I'm, I'm, I'm still not any good at that now. Oh, trust I trust them. people just fine. Um, one hundred percent. This this channel has changed my life. I had it was no choice. I had no choice. These people completely surrounded me and showered me with so much love and decency. And, uh, I, I made friends immediately with people. And I think I started my channel like August 1st. And I think, um, I mean, for me, it was pretty instant Tommy, but as, as summer started to come to a close, um, I really started to feel scared of what was to come with like the holidays. This would be our first holiday outside of Scientology, outside of our family. And my son's birthday is a week before Thanksgiving. And I had never had a Thanksgiving with Huxley before. This was my first Thanksgiving with him. They took him away every single year for it. I've never had one. So, um, I was afraid of Christmas. I was afraid of what I was going to do for Thanksgiving and spend it with him and then his birthday. And I just thought I have to figure out a way to not be sad, to make this special. His, you know, um, that was, I think, what really turned it around. The people on my channel 
made his birthday. I mean, it was just the gifts and the love and the support. And I mean, I got cards from people in Sweden, Portugal, all over the world. So it's impossible to go. These are bad people. I mean, it is the true definition of unconditional love. I've never felt it before. I have never been loved like that before. <laughs> Sorry. I long to be an old crusty guy, a uh, crusty old guy, Paris. Me too, apparently. I'm too young. That's what it is. Right? I stopped dying to go to you. See what I'm doing here? I'm trying. I, I asked you to do that. Yeah, it's not, it's not, it hasn't worked yet, but I'm working on it. I'm, uh, I'm absolutely working on it. Um, I have a question for you. So, since you left, Right, your channel took off faster than anyone's I've ever seen for the record. Unless you're Justin Bieber, nobody hits ten thousand in six weeks. That's a beautiful thing, right? And you've built a uh, um, a pretty quick audience. You don't have an appreciation for uh, for how fast you do that. But the the SPTV thing is a uh, is a phenomenon, right? It absolutely is. It's a it's a phenomenon. Where do you see yourself in this? And the reason I ask is I've talked. Where do you to what you cut out? Where do you see yourself? Where do you see yourself in this uh, fight? There are people that are, that are very vocal about they want to they want to take out this, they want to do that. Where do you see yourself in this? Do you want to even be fighting this thing? In my own way, I I I don't like group think because I was involved in a lot of group think. Um. So I'm kind of into this new thing where I do my own thing and awesome. I completely support what everybody's doing. That that's not, that goes hand in hand. I support what they're doing, but I believe that everybody should be able, you know, the thing about, and, and I don't want to speak for everyone, but for me, I have been censored. I have not been able to speak how I feel. And so having this channel, um, I'm going to do and say what I want to without being judged or you, you really should be doing this. You're not really helping take down Scientology or, you know, you really shouldn't be a part of it because you're not really, you know, you kind of talk about other things. Um, I'm just uh, clearly I'm doing something right. And I'm just going to keep moving forward without, um, you know, Chihuahua's nipping at my heels. I think that the goal is to, of course, my goal is to take down Scientology, of course, but it's also to heal and to bring people together who have other stories that have nothing to do with Scientology, stories of abuse, mm -hmm. anything, anything in their past. And we come together and I find that to be incredibly powerful just as much. I love that. I love that. Patricia Sham says, when I first viewed your channel, I saw that you needed a change and that your journey would bring you to where you are now. Blossoming into a radiant soul, helping others through humor and love. Love that. Freaking Thank love you, that. Patricia M. Thank you. And you know what? I think that, that there's really something to this. I, uh, I spend a lot of time talking to, uh, to Reese. Not, not quite to the stalker level, but, but I spend a decent amount of time trying to, uh, to reach out to Reese. And we talk about, um, about doing shows and, uh, and things of this. Uh, but the connection thing is bizarre it really is until you get in the middle of it and it was fun because i had talked to reese prior to running into her in florida and she said no one knows who i am and then watching reese they get out don't. of the car where people know him oh everyone knew who you are and it was wild to see the connection because you know what reese was as excited to see the people that were in the audience as the audience was to see reese and you know what you can't fake that and you've heard me say things like you meet people who are YouTubers and occasionally you go, oh, damn, you know, they're just not what I thought they were going to be. And I've met a bunch of them and 99% of them really are who you think they're going to be. But when they're not, it's a bummer. And I think you guys lose sight of the fact that, you know, the people who are here every day talking to us, we kind of look at you the same way you look at us. Oh, I love that. What a great comment nice yeah i love her thank you yeah better together i love that i really do i absolutely love that 
So I don't know. I'm, I, I think I feel happy to hear that. I think that I've watched individuals and um, not, not in this particular, but I've watched people who do what I do, who um, will get out of 35 or 40 years of, uh, of addiction and live the exact same life for the next 25. They just don't do drugs, but they're in the life every day and they're out there and they're fighting and they're fighting. And I think that's awesome. I'm fighting for that cause too. I just don't want it to define every single aspect of every minute of my day. I'd kind of like to maybe make up for some lost time and laugh a little, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely. Ripple says Spanky. I like the, uh, yes. I like the ripple concept. I want to talk to you about sympathy. Because this is something that I find unique with, um, I've known a lot of Scientologists, right? A bunch. I knew a bunch of Scientologists before meeting A.A. Ron, right? We, this is going to sound awful, right? But they tend to run in the same kind of scammy businesses that I was doing for a long uh, period of my life. So there was a bunch of them. And they can be incredibly sympathetic people. But my experience is that they've been very sympathetic within um within their organization and sometimes brutally uh, not so much to people who are outside. Did you find yourself struggling with that when you left? You understand what I'm saying? The screw them. They don't have, they have no idea what suffering is phenomenon. Yeah. I'm kind of tracking. I'm not really tracking because the re it's, I, I, I gave you a smile when you said sympathy oh, no, because Sympathy is uh, in the Dianetics book. It's highly touched on in Scientology. It is hugely uh, detrimental to be ha have any kind of sympathy because it's bad for the reactive mind. So um, we are taught very young. Like for, I mean, I remember being, I think I was six and I got really sick. I had asthma really bad as a kid. And, um, I mean, my dad would just get furious with us when we were sick and it was just like no rewards, no TV. Like it's, it's sympathy comes like you have to purposefully be nasty when somebody's like, you know, when you would apply sympathy, right. To a child who's very sick, you'd think you would be very comforting and sympathetic. And so the reason I'm, I'm confused by your question is it is a no, no in Scientology to have sympathy. It's, it's a serious word that is, you can't, you, you can't do it. <laughs> okay. And the reason I ask is this, I have heard two of the most vile things ever stated in my life out of, um, ex Scientologists in reference to people who are in some really tough situations. One person who said, after I wouldn't care if she unalived herself today. And I remember sitting there and going, 100%. I'm sorry. What? Like I, I literally was, uh, it's, I've done that. It, it I'm guilty be, of that. I've said that. It's a recurring theme though. It's not just, I, I see this very often. So, but I'm glad you're explaining this. So could you double back on that and explain to me what it is they say? Yeah, about? we don't, uh, we, <laughs> the, I, I say we, because I'm still kind of stuck in this thinking. I get it. No, that's cool. We don't view death the same at all. It's very much viewed as getting out of one car and getting into another. There's there's nothing on death. So, yes, yeah, somebody unaliving themselves, it's like, okay, well, ta-ta. Yeah, do it. Go for it. Nobody feels anything about something like that. And I, I am guilty of that. Um, my father was married after when I was on staff. Um, he came in to come on course to the Kansas City Org. And they got divorced. She had four kids. She was an OTA. She died of breast cancer right oh, before sure. he was getting ready to go on course, right before roll call. Okay. It was 345 roll call. He gets off the phone. He goes, oh man, dang. And somebody, my mother-in-law was there and she said, what, what is everything all right? And he said, I just got a phone call that Kathy died. She dropped the body. And they were like, do you need a minute? Do we need to go do an assist? And he went, Nah, she'll be all right. She's a good girl. It's zero. There's zero. I mean, that is, it's cold to you, but it's very common in Scientology. If somebody loses a job, you know, and has five kids to support, it's, well, you must have done something to pull that in. 
you know, you need to go write up what you've done and get started again. It is, it is, you're not allowed to be sick. You're not allowed to, you know, die and be sad. I mean, I have been to countless Scientology funerals, no crying, right. no tears. That's, I mean, that is common. So. The, yeah. My, uh, the gentleman that I worked one-on-one -on -one with, I've talked to you about, uh, many times, uh, his father unalived himself with a uh, handgun and I picked him up from him cleaning. And I didn't realize this at the time, but I picked him up from him cleaning the uh, place he had just inherited, which still had dad all over it. And he came out like throwing all the stuff at me. He had stuff all over him. I said, what is that? And he went, my dad's brains. And he said it like you would say, somebody spilled some, uh, you know, some, some soda in the kitchen or whatever. I went, what? He's like, yeah, he blew his, blew his head out in the kitchen. He's like, but I got the condo. And I remember just going, like, it was the most bizarre thing to me because I had, you know, my dad and I, that was, my dad was my best man at my wedding. So, and I just said, dude, you're not bummed out. He's like, nah, not even slightly. And he was very, very, I said, did you guys have a crap relationship? He's like, nah, he's I. Right. But I remember being blown away by it. And my, and my friend's going, yeah, he's the, part of his religion is he's just, that's part of who he is. Well, and, um, and I just want to say that's horrible. I'm not, I'm not condoning that. That's horrible, but I get it. One, just coming from where I came from, but we are, this is kind of stems back to you, Tommy. I hope that you can connect this and understand Joe virus. You finally figured it out, brother. I'm proud of you. Um, I want you to understand something and really, I want everybody to understand this from the age of four, sitting in that kitchen, shaking, freaked out, start flunk, start flunk. The whole purpose of that is to desensitize. We are training to be auditors. Auditors are not allowed to have any emotion. They are to be the highest trained beings on the planet. They are to have no reactions to anything. We are to be ready. Uh, some auditors who were do doing their trainings in Kansas City would go to the most wicked haunted houses around ha uh, Halloween just as a to go through and not have a reaction to anything. So like people jumping out at you, grabbing you. And it, it was a training to go flunk if you react at all. You have to have no emotion, but be in full present time. So we are training countless hours for that, for our whole lives. So when you think about that, there's no emotion. What is that? My dad's brain matter. Eh, it'd be all right. I got the condo. Uh, what happened? My wife just died. Yeah, she's a good girl. She'll be all right. I can't tell you how many. I mean, it's just it just is what it is. Um, and I think that's why now I cry all the effing time because I don't use my training anymore. And, um, I don't, I feel more than I've ever felt. My emotions are so much more amplified now. I react to everything. So it's probably not a good thing. And I'm sure people are like, whoa, girl, reel it in, dial it back. But I, I sometimes can't help it. You know, I think uh, there's probably a decent amount of the audience here that may understand that for, for uh, other reasons. My uh, my maternal uh, grandmother, I was closer to her than anybody on, on planet Earth. I didn't go to her funeral, though, because it would have required me going without dope. And that was not something that I could do at that point in my life. It was not, I mean, it was not even, there was never a discussion. It was just, you know, sorry, I, w I would love to be able to, but there's no, you know, I can't travel. And that was just one of those things, you know, um, and, and drugs do that too. I mean, they really do. They cut you off so much from, uh, from the ability to feel anything, um, that yeah. the same thing happens once, once you break away from that and the control that has been the prison that has been, you know, of your own making when that's all gone, then all of those emotions that you haven't had in 25 years bubble to the surface. And I cry at a good, you know, Walmart commercial. I'm done. I would too, but I don't watch TV, but yeah, no, I, I, I feel very sensitive to things now that, um, for so long, um, I mean, I, I, I've been to a lot of Scientology funerals. I've, I've witnessed a lot of deaths. Um, it's just not the same thing. It's not the same thing. Have, um, have you ever gone back and, uh, watched any of your really early stuff? Never. No, I think you should sometime. Yeah. I really I, think you should sometime. I just don't. 
you've uh, you've really come a really really long way in a horrifically short period of time. I I have been out right three years, um, and I had five years uh, head start before I left. Right, knowing I was leaving to get my life in order mentally to work on all of the things that I needed. That I didn't get. Hey, you're out. Right, I had a very very long time and. These three years have been amazingly hard, right? And I've had a lot of advantages that you simply didn't have, right? The the whole bye bye, right? That I can't imagine that. I really can't. If they had kicked me out, if they you know six months early and said, "Hey, you're out of here," I probably would have gone straight back because you, I had to have. You know, it's just a really it's why ninety percent of people end back, end up back in prison is because they the the devil you know. Right, the place you knew, as bad as it is, it was something you understood, and they took care of you. As bad as it is, you didn't have to worry about anything, right? Yeah, you might have to fight, you might have to do this, but you didn't have to worry about paying bills. You don't have to worry about doing any of these things, and it's it's insane. But I watched guys who said, "I'm going to go out and do something immediately to get back in." You know, it's yeah. I'm not surprised by people who stay in. I'm surprised by people who get out. And that's Definitely. cults, that's drugs, that's crime, that's anything. I'm, I, I've am i always said it takes a miracle. It really does. It takes an absolute miracle. One of the most emotional things I've seen since I started doing YouTube was watching you when um, when George was filming you in front of the uh, the building in, uh, in Flag. <clears throat> want to walk us through that? I stayed away, which was really a hard thing to do because I was, but. So there was a gentleman um, who was, I knew that he had just attested to the state of clear, which is a large step on the bridge in Scientology. It's a step that you have to get to in order to get to the OT levels. Um, he looked really happy. He had his clear certificate and, um, he was outside the church and I knew what was going on based on just how he, you know, presented himself. And I congratulated him and he looked so excited and I, I'm not clear, but I knew I've seen a million people attest to clear. I know what a big deal it is. It's a really big deal. Um, it's something very to be celebrated and, um, I was happy for him. And he just, I felt very connected. We looked at each other. He knew that I knew what he meant, you know, what was going on. And um, I think it just felt good to, to, you know, say something to him that was meaningful. And he just seemed, I could tell just, I, I'm good at looking at people. I could tell that he was probably such a nice person. And um, yeah. And they came out and got him immediately and took him up the stairs. And the guy, the Sea Org guy said something to the guy that just attested to clear. And he turned, the guy turned around one last time and looked at me in like fear, like whatever he had said to him was, you know, I'm, I'm a total enemy. I'm a suppressive person. And, um, I think, I don't know what happened there, Tommy, but it was so instant, but I think both of our hearts broke a little bit. I think the guy was shocked because he saw me, he appreciated it and he trusted me in that moment. And what he was told was, I think it's just so not what he felt. Foreign. Didn't make any sense. It's not what he and, saw. Right. And just, I think it, um, after he was taken in and the door closed and I felt I will never, um, it was weird to be on the other side of that door. It was weird to know I can't go in there. It was weird to say, you know, I'm, I'm not allowed to go in and celebrate with him or I'm not allowed to go in and see my family in there. And so all my life I've been told about people being declared and the people who aren't allowed through the door, but I never thought I would be one of them. And um, it was very scary in that moment to watch it was almost like I just felt like they were like, how did he get out of his cage? Get in here, get in here, put him back in his cage. You know, it was just, and it was sadness that I couldn't go in, but it was so much 
relief that I'm out. I'm free. I don't, nobody's coming out to whisk me in here and, you know, scream at me for, you know, talking to a suppressive person. I can do what I want. And it was just all kind of came down on me at once. And I thought, this is hard. It's a weird feeling of, I'm sad that I can't go in, but I'm so happy that I'm out. You want to, you want to hear what a never in saw that cat saw pure joy in your face because there was nothing else. You weren't, I'm not busting. I'll get, I'll get hate mail for this, but you weren't auditing. You weren't doing anything. You weren't busting anybody's chops. He saw no lie. I'm so happy for you. Pure, pure joy in your and face. And I was. And then, and then had someone tell him that you were a dirt bag. I, and I saw the look on his face of confusion. You know what I mean? Like it, it was non sequitur. This was not adding up at all. Yeah. And, and it was painful. It really was. It was a horrific moment. I actually gave yeah. a Reese a hug when that was over because it just was, I think it, I think it broke the heart of everybody that was watching, at least on this side of the friggin' door. And I know at least one person on that side was hurting because the look on that guy's face was, he was, uh, he was confused and he wasn't happy. Yeah. It sucked. Yeah. Yeah. It was really hard. Now I will say, you know, I've been asked to go protest since then. And I, I've said, it's not my thing. I just don't think it's my thing. And I don't want to put myself in danger. You know, I don't know how to defend myself. I don't, I don't want to wind up arrested or like trapped, you know, to where they do arrest me or something like that. Um, but at the same time, what I did, I don't regret. And that's what, if I did go protest, that's what I would do. I would make the connections that I can make and um, just keep it very real. I'm not, I don't want to stand there and shout at people, you know, or, you know, I, I really appreciate and enjoyed what I, the connection I made with that man. Right. We, uh, we went out to eat and, and for those who have never, I mean, if you've never gone out with, uh, with Reese, we went out to, to uh, where we were heading to eat and Reese went and asked nine people questions in the course of about two blocks Asked one one couple for directions. Asked another uh, group of women about what the best restaurants were in town were. Are they walking distances and that? You connect with every single person that walks by you, for real. It's something to watch. I love doing it that. really is. I know, but most people don't see. This is another thing that you you just assume everybody does. Nobody does. It's another one of these things that you do that's wizardry. There's nobody that you walk up to. Um, we went to the the uh, coffee place. It was the same thing in Starbucks. I just sort of sat back and, and marveled watching it. Um, and I marvel watching it because I know a grip of Scientologists and none of them are like that. Yeah, so I again, that I just assume that it's so weird. It's It sounds stupid to say or like a, a fake answer, but it's the truth. I assume everybody does that. Yeah. I don't have well, friends, also... Tommy. I don't hang out with people. I just assume everybody does that. I'm not, I'm not friends. I haven't had friends. Oh, ah, that's better. That's better. Thank you. Was... Oh, yeah. Get it. Look at those paddles, you guys. Little little hand. It. Little hand. It's crazy. Sorry. Uh, no, honestly, the um, I ho I hope that uh, someday I hope that someday we could do that again. Truthfully, um, I would like to walk around uh, and do it differently. I would like to walk around, make the filming a little less obvious, and I would like to see someone that really understands everything that those people are doing. Talk to them as a human being, because if you talk to them as a human being and you're not yelling and you're not doing any of that when they separate you and tell that person you're Satan, they might just go, hey, she didn't look like Satan. If you're screaming at them, maybe you do look like Satan, right? But if you have a big smile on your face and you say, congratulations, I promise you the cat at the top of that stairs didn't think you were Satan. Sorry. The uh, What did you think of people jumping out of the bushes? Sorry, I thought we needed some comic relief. <clears throat> I was confused by that. I found it entertaining. I didn't know what to think. Um, but I even talked to those guys. I talked to those guys. You did. Um, I just wasn't aware of what was going on there. They weren't Scientologists. I, I don't know. There was a Willie Nelson concert. So I just assume like 
They were either they were getting roadies. down to pound town or, oh, okay. I didn't know what was going on. Yeah, um, I didn't until later, but apparently they uh, they do what my kid does for a living, which gives me a warm and fuzzy. That maybe in the future, hmm. Spanky will be jumping out of bushes, making me proud. No, I'm kidding. It's a great working career. Tonight. You know what? This is a good point. It It's okay not to protest. Don't let anybody pressure you just because you're on uh, YouTube. Most former Scientologists are not out there protesting. It's pretty scary facing your abuser, especially so soon. And you know what? What a great way to put that, Amy Lee. God, it is so scary facing your abuser. That, it, that would be that very large building on both sides of the country and all of the smaller ones along the way, right? The abuser is more than the person that, that uh, hit you with a fax machine or the person who had uh, sex with you when you were a child. Um, you know, the, that entire cult. Uh, is the abusers. And as far as I, uh, I, I saw in a uh, interview you did once where someone said, you know, would you, would you like the person prosecuted or whatever? And I've, I've heard you talk about this and, and seeing the person and whatever. Um, I think we look at things sometimes through really weird lenses. That had to be normal. I realize it's not, but that had to be normal. Like you didn't think at any point during any of that, that what you were doing was odd, correct? Like this was something that until you got out or or at 14, did you think 24, what the hell's wrong with this guy? Or did you think I'm an adult, he's an adult? I was smoking. No, I didn't think anything was wrong with that. <laughs> to be honest, I still don't in many ways. I just saw him for the first time since I was 16, two weeks ago. And I um, was, go ahead, I'm sorry. How long ago? I just saw him for the first time since I was 16. I saw him two weeks ago in Seattle. Um, I, I don't hold anything against him because he's the only one that helped. I mean, I had to go to a hospital after I was hit and choked and all of that by Dan and nobody would take me. I was asking people, I said, I need medical help. And they were like, you can go F yourself. You're destroying this organization. I was peeing blood he's the only one that took me to a hospital and I don't know what would have happened. So I don't hold anything against him. And I think he was probably just as messed up as, you know, I mean, he was in that thinking way of thinking as well. I don't, I, I remember it very clearly. I was with that guy for two years. It wasn't like we slept with each other once and, you know, he was my boyfriend. So he took care of me, you know, he was, he was protective and I don't have any, yeah, sure. He was 24. I mean, my kid is 14 now. If something like that were happening, I would burn everything to the ground and I would be in prison the rest of my life. Well, um, and in, uh, you know, if he had not been in the uh, in the church, he probably would in the cult. He probably would be as well. I, uh, I got probation for being with a uh, girl that was one year younger than I was before I was 18. How's that? So you, you would be shocked how, uh, how that's punished in some states. I wasn't even 18. So it's, uh, it is yeah. possible, but that's a big age gap. Uh, it really is. But I think, because I've heard people go off, you know, he ought to be in people. We, we look at things sometimes through lenses that we, we have no clue what we're looking through. You understand that in there, they're both too full, like actuated. And I'm not giving this cat a pass because the, but the cult is who's to blame. Right. This is a doctrine that's so effed up that it allowed everything else. Right. All of these other really horrific things that happened happened because there isn't a legal. Right. The legal uh, uh, department is within the cult. And that's terrifying. Right. That's, that's correct. terrifying. Yeah. Because, I mean, I, I actually did have somebody come and um, do something sexual sexually to me that I did not welcome. It was against my will. It was terrifying. And he was like almost 50 when I was 16. Oh, and, God. um, I, I was terrified and it happened when I was on staff and I reported it within the church and I got in huge trouble for that. So he's right guys. I mean, there's no, um, it's not like they're going to take it to the police. Now they should because they're mandated reporters, they're ministers, but um, they didn't. And it was, it was horrible. It was horrible. So I, I guess the reason I don't hold anything against Shane is he was 
I didn't feel like it was against my will. This individual who came into my office when I was working at the org flipped me around at a filing cabinet and just like shoved me really hard and was groping me, grabbing me. I was trying to push him off of me and I couldn't get him off of me. That's a different situation. And that was wrong. No question. No question. The uh, question has come up a couple of times and every time it has, they were, they were curious of how, uh, what kind of uh, affection did you show Hux uh, as a kid because of how much different it was for you? They know that he, he didn't go off into uh, Sea Org, but they were curious about um, that, uh, the, the affections along the way. Not a lot. I uh, have always, always made it a point with, with words. So verbally, I have always said, I love you so much. I'm so proud of you. You know, I've always made a point because my dad never did that. And that's something that I always wished he had done. I think I would have been a much more confident woman growing up. I think it would have shaped me more if somebody would have said like, Hey, I love you. I'm really proud of you. There was no foundation there now, but physically I did not show a lot of affection to Huxley just because like my therapist said, do you hug? And I was like, no, he said, do you hug your son? And I was like, you know, I mean, sometimes, you know, birthdays, maybe, I don't know. I just, I'm not real touchy. And I didn't even realize that I don't touch him. Like it wasn't really a thought until we talked about it in therapy. So now I do, I make a point to hug him. It's kind of interesting because he's so much taller than me now. I mean, I'm like, wow, this is so weird. Cause I didn't do this when he was little. Um, but I've always, always made it very a solid structure that like he knows he can always come to me. I mean, Huxley and I've always had more of a solid uh, communication than anything, not so much physical, but we talk about everything, everything and how you're always safe to come to me. I'm never going to yell at you, be mad at you. I just want to help you with the tools that you need for life right. you know, to shape who you're going to be as a man. Um, but I, I hug him more now. It's just, hasn't been the norm for me. I just haven't been a huggy person. I don't know. I got a pretty good one. No, it was without, good. without even having to bust out my fur coat, which, uh, we, uh, not afraid to bust out just for the record, not afraid to. Um, so the, uh, you're officially, so you got doxxed on, uh, on the 1st of January, right? New Year's Eve rather. Um, yeah. but that's not, but the uh, ship hit the sand officially when? The next day. I feel like there were, there was no, cause weren't there two. So, oh no. The other celebration was the anniversary of your first AA run uh, thing. That's what it was. Correct. I feel like there were two anniversaries. I was at one. He was at the other. What was the other anniversary? Polar porn. <laughs> There's really, really, is, that is always going to crack me up. I'm sorry. That's right. Wait till that cruise. That is, really going to really, be in for uh, a show. Right. You're going to be in for a show. Yeah, that's, um, we're going to be the only two people in a fur coat on a cruise. I promise. I hope so. Um, I um, I don't think there was another anniversary. Just the New Year's Eve thing. Well, that's the one I did. Then you did one with A.A. Ron recently. Must have been the 20,000 thing. Uh, no, raise your hand I if you've gotten a hug from Reese. Oh, I guess no one else. Oh, no, Laura, Laura did. I mean, I did a Fred anniversary. The thing with Aaron I did recently, we were going to talk about my trip to Seattle and Shane and all of that, but we really didn't get into it. He spent, you know, most of the time we were talking about memberships and things. We really didn't get into what I was hoping to get into. Uh -huh. I'm not really sure what we covered, honestly. It was just a bunch of silly nonsense. It'll be the 13th of the month. Maybe that's what I was going for. 13th of this month for her first video. Thank you. Maybe that's what I was going for. I felt like we had a conversation, but you know how my brain is. Um, I felt like yeah. we had a conversation about that. We may not have. It could have been somebody else. I'm not. Uh, you know. Anniversary after your first interview with him. Maybe that's what it was. I don't know. I don't know. See, you have to come here to talk about the feelings. There you go. Um, it's interesting because that's one of the questions that uh, I am absolutely of all of the things um, I am most impressed, I think. Uh, aside from your YouTube stuff, and I've told you all about that, tell me how you uh, tell me how you go from from uh, the doctrine that you grew up with to the I'm going to go get some counseling. Like, how the hell did that take place? 
Um, I mean, that's a good question. I think, I think I was struggling so much and it was so not me. It was very out of character to not be able to get out of bed, to not make him dinner to, you know, I mean, it just, I was totally out of my daily routine. I'd never been that depressed. And I think I just, it almost makes me think of when I was doing drugs, when I got hooked on meth, I specifically remember I did it for a little over two years. And I was one morning I woke up and I had like the darkest, my face was so sunk in. And I remember looking in the mirror and I just thought it was kind of the same thing. I thought, I'm going to die. This is going to kill me. I'm, I look terrible. This is going to kill me. If I don't pull myself out of this, I don't have any other option. This is, this is it, you know? And so it was kind of the same. I just thought of that. I just, it's very similar. I, I remember getting out of bed thinking there is no other option here. Like I'm just sinking every day. It's getting worse. I can't do that with a child. I have responsibilities. What do I do? And I just thought I need help. Who can help me? Okay, well, um, the person I'm married to can't. My mother can't. There are people who have tools that can, and I need those tools. And so I started researching it and just thought it's the same thing. I I, I don't, there's no other, I either run out of air or I, I, I got to find a lifeline here. How, how frightening was that first session? <laughs> I mean, not at all. Did you feel like, I'm such no? a chatter. No, I was super excited. No, I just and meant I, I just meant they literally have told you people that that this is the most evil SOBs on earth, right? Well, yeah, yeah. Mm. And and we're gonna get electric shocked and drugged. And so I was I was at the end of my rope anyway. So I was like, let's just see what this is about. Now I remember my first session, like I mean, it was just pop, 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 my typical self. No. And the person, no. the, the lady was like, my, she was like, it really, you, I don't have to get anything out of you. Do I, I was like, what else can I tell you about the third grade? <laughs> She's going, we're, we're about 45 minutes. I want, yeah. I was like, is there a couch? Like, do we go to lunch and come back? What do we do? This is fun. Uh, no, I definitely had no, pro I was not nervous. Um, I was actually, I think so excited. Cause I, I had it, I had the intuition. I had a feeling like, this is the right thing. This is going to help me just go with it. You know, you got no other choice. It was kind of like right. quitting drugs. And as, uh, as, as, uh, Kristen said, nah, electroshock is way too expensive. And by the way, mm. pain's not what they say it is anyway. Trust me. Um, yeah, I don't ever want to uh, that. D, it was nice to meet you as well. Please, please be safe. Always nice. Um, what has been your, you are literally at the one year mark, right? What has been the, and I'm sure you've heard this one, but I've never asked. What has been the biggest culture shock? <laughs> to see you from when you started your first video to now. I swear to God, is like watching two different people. It's bizarre. In fact, watching you now from a month and a half ago is like watching two different people. It is so exciting to me. And I'm sure it is to all of your fans because I am a fan. But I think it's probably exciting to everybody to watch this take place live. I think that's the I think that the reason that this channel is as popular as it is yours is because the world is literally watching wow. you come into your own. And that's some some stuff that uh, doesn't happen very often. Lisa, are you suggesting I took notes? I am offended. I, said, I still love you, but I'm offended. I, I'll have Tommy, you know I was looking at a cat. So nice of you to say. Um, I... Um... I feel the growth, for sure. I don't go back and watch stuff, so maybe I should. Maybe I should. Um, I talk so to so many of these people privately. So, um, oh, Barbara, well, I will say Clearwater really shook me. It made me, it motivated me in so many good ways. It made me want to do more stuff with Tommy because I had such a good time with him there. It just makes me want to connect with people more and more. I think the biggest shock, um, is people. I, I was pretty scared of the outside world. I have been told some very specific things since I can, as long as I can remember about who people are outside the doors of Scientology. 
And once I found that wasn't true, um, I have just embraced the hell out of it. I mean, ask the people who are in the chat right now who I've actually met in person. I, how many people, how many of you, I, I met so many of them and they kind of, a couple of them went to hug me and, and I think they were nervous maybe. And they went to let go and I held them tighter and I said, I'm not done. I'm not done. And it was just, I, I just feel so sure of myself now. I feel so like, this is what I want to do. And, um, I have been lied to for 38 years. I was lied to. And I feel like the, uh, the blinders are off and, um, there's just no going back. That's the biggest shock in such a good way. It's a miracle. About 25 people have said this, by the way. So I just highlighted Chris and Melinda, but about 25 people have said this. Reese, if you rewatch nothing else, rewatch your first video out and then compare it to your first live back from Clearwater. By the way, Kristen, if I had texted you, right, and said, please text this and put it up there, that's what I would have said. So thank you. That is a perfect comment. What does she mean by my first video? The one with Aaron? The, the first video you put up, on, the very first time you put up a video on YouTube, watch it and then watch the one that you did coming back from, the one that you did okay. coming back from, uh, from Clearwater. Okay. Half of my audience reached out to me and said, have you seen this video? That's when I realized how many of the people on my channel actually watched your channel. Oh, okay. I'll do it. How do you come to grips with people that were in your life so long, not talking to you so quickly? I think you may have touched you know. on that early, but you don't, right? I mean, you don't. It's um, You don't. Is there massive amount of resentment? Is there resentment toward any of them, Reese, or is it aimed at the cult? Um. I don't know that I feel resentment. I don't know that that's the word. I don't feel I angry. Hate. I don't Oh no. I don't feel hate. I don't feel angry. Um, I think I've risen above that. At first I felt very angry. Um, I miss those people very much. I miss them in my life. I now know that what we had was completely conditional and full of lies. You know, I miss something that doesn't exist. I miss something that was made up in my mind. You know, I don't, they don't care about me. They don't, um, a suppressive person is equated to Hitler. So they think of me as that. I mean, if someone called my father tomorrow and said, did you hear that she died? He would go, oh God, thank God. You know, I've been waiting for that. She was a horrible person. So, I just feel sadness about it now. I don't feel, um, there's so many stories I have with those people. And so it's hard for me to just turn it into hate. I have my memories um, and. I don't I, I get that. I I'm, I'm pissed off. I'm pissed off still at all of the people that overdosed. I really am now. I know it's not their fault. I mean, I understand the disease, all the concept. I do this all day, every day. But there are days that I am so friggin' mad at them for leaving this planet, right? Without kind of going and clearing it with me first, kind of a thing. I, so Spanx Calhoun, right? Um, if my old in-laws said, said to my son, we're not going to talk to you anymore because of this religion. Now I'm a, I'm a convict and probably an idiot. I would go over there and kick that door in and then kick their heads in. I would be really pissed. There's no way I would ever be able to get over that. I respect the fact that you've been able to, maybe it's because of, of, of how long you were in and you understand what they're going through, but I just, I'm blown away by that. I think it's amazing. There's, there's one person. And I think that I hold a lot of blame toward because he was kind of half in half out just mentally. Now he's been in for over 40 years, but, um, that was my father-in-law, Doug. He was the closest person in my life. I, his wife, Brenda, and I were extremely close. But when I say close, I mean physically. He was at my house at least four days a week. He took Huxley every weekend. 
I never had a Thanksgiving with Huxley. He spent it with him. Um, he was kind of our rock. I mean, Doug helped me financially when I needed it. He would have shown up at two in the morning if I needed him. He was just like my dad. He was very much like my dad. And, um, he loves and loved Huxley so much. And I thought when Aaron told me what happened, I thought I'm going to hang on to Doug. I know Doug won't leave us. Like I know that he's going to fight. He's going to fight tooth and nail as much as he can. He won't just let us go. I just, I had that built in my mind. I was like, at least I have that to hold on to. I know he's going to fight for us. And we never heard from him again. And that really, and he was so close to Huxley and, um, Huxley was not willing to, um, accept that Huxley, a couple of months went them. by and he said, I, it's, they wouldn't answer my calls. They but took Huxley's Huxley, didn't they? Yes. And I couldn't listen to the phone call. I mean, it was so hard that you could tell that they had gotten to Doug. He had been totally drilled and trained at the point for this phone call. And he was a total robot. The emotion was gone. And Huxley is not, not, I cannot stress this enough, an emotional person. He's very matter of fact. He's just very black and white and um, strong. He's a strong minded person. And he called Doug and I mean, it was just immediate. He was like, <laughs> like he just couldn't even. And I knew that there must have been so much deep rooted emotion there for him to behave, for Huxley right. to react that way. And, and, and let me I guess have, it was the, uh, it's, it's been a good uh, 12 years. See ya. That's what he said. He said, I've known you for 13 years, but this has come to an end. And, uh, he said, Huxley knows this. He knew the rules in Scientology. And he said, I can't. He said, I don't, I please don't leave us. He said, please, please. I can't leave my mom. He said, I can't disconnect because Huxley would have to disconnect from me in order to stay in Doug's life. You've got to let one person go at, to, to make it work. And I just couldn't, couldn't hardly listen. I was so upset watching my kid. Just, he was just gasping for air. He couldn't even talk. And he was like, please, please don't leave, leave us. He was like, don't leave my mom. And oh my God, Huxley's so smart. Oh, God. He said, Doug said, you know, it's been, it's been a good time knowing you. He said, it's, you know, I've known you for this long. And Huxley, um, Huxley is so, again, so profound. He said, I wish you would understand. He said, my mom didn't do anything to your church. Your church did something to my mom. And he said, I understand. I got it. He was like, understood. It was just very robotic. And um, it was horrific. It was so hard for me. It was heartbreaking because also he didn't fight for us like I thought he would. And that was it. So that's the only person I think I hold resentment in my heart. Just on the outside chance, you know, that he catches this. Doug, you suck. I'm sorry. And you know what? I know it's a cult. And I know it's all that. But you know what? I'm sorry. It's there comes a point, and I'm not trying to sound like a cool guy. I swear to Christ, I'm not. But there comes a point where that doesn't fly anymore, and you just have to say, you know what? Hey, I went in and they said you got to call that guy the N word, right? And then you got to put a SWAT sticker on you. And I said, no, you can just keep stabbing me, because there are things in life that you just draw a line and say, I'm doing the right thing, right? So, Doug, you suck. You're all set. And honestly, I'm Sorry. looking at it now. I don't want, I'm glad I don't want him in our life. I think he's toxic. I, I, I and the beautiful thing about this is Huxley was asked on one of my lives once and Huxley, thank God is so strong and confident in himself. I really was worried. My biggest fear was he was going to blame himself and go, why did he leave? What did I do to make him? You know, I thought it was going to be like a taking himself apart to figure out what happened. And I loved his confidence. Somebody asked him about Doug. And Huxley just said, well, they made their choice. Like it was very like, it's not me, it's them. And I was so proud of that. I thought, oh my God, again, if I die tonight, like I will die happy because he is also on top of it and very, it's so strong. It just shows so much strength and his confidence in himself. And that's all I want for him is to have self-esteem. And he wasn't shaken much by it. It was just very, and oh, somebody said, He's so cool. Somebody said, do you, you know, do you need a therapist? I have been trying to get him to see a therapist. And he always says, 
I will let you know, but I don't feel like I need one. And he says, I channel, I channel it through sports, mom. He's like, I'm doing good. You know, I'm doing really good with my sports. Um, and I talked to my therapist about it. And my therapist says the kid's great. If he says that and he's playing sports and he's making friends, like he's doing all the healthy things. He's not, you know, recluse. Right. So he's just, again, like, I don't care what happens to me. <clears throat> I'm just so proud that like, he's, he is where he is mentally. Cause it could have gone in a much worse way. Right. Could have been much Absolutely. worse. Absolutely. Absolutely. He's also, he's also a 14 year old boy. And I'll be really honest, you know, when, uh, when the Scoville boys, you know, were from basically 12 to 20, we were just the world's biggest jackasses to my, uh, to my parents, my mom in particular, you know what I mean? Boys, it, it's an uncomfortable thing, unfortunately, but the, the teens under the best of circumstances are pretty tough, right? We were, um, Holy God, my mom is a saint, you know, but and we had that, there was nothing like that. There was no, nothing traumatic and we were just crappy kids. So, you know, I think you got a really good boy, man. I really do. Seems like a great kid. And he can kick a 35 year old, a 35 year yard field goal in eighth grade, which is pretty damn impressive. You're really into that. That's pretty, uh, yeah, it's a big deal. It's just that you don't realize it's, it's, it's the same kind of wizardry that he did with his foot that you do at the show. The fact that you don't understand that doesn't make it any less wizardry either. That's such a, and if we got any football fans here, come on, man. Somebody do me a, a solid on this 35 yards in the eighth grade. Somebody do me a solid. I know we got at Good least point. one football fan that's going to go. I'm sorry. What? He broke the record. Uh, sweet Liberty. I wouldn't put any money on that. Listen, I, I really appreciate what you're saying. I, I was a pretty bad kid. I could tell you stories for days. I was a pretty bad kid. Um, yeah, 35 yards is indeed quite impressive. Thank you. See? Guys and Dolls, you can't say that. It's my favorite musical. I'll bust into show tunes. I know more show tunes than any straight man in history. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Sorry, what was that? Thank you for responding to comments. You know, that's how I meet people. I'm not, <laughs> that's how I meet. It is almost half a football field. Thank you. See, we're, we're helping her pick this up. It's almost half a football field, right? It's okay, also, okay. it is also that distance from which if you can hit every time, he'll take care of you for the rest of your life. You never have to worry about anything. Your son will be writing big checks to take care of Ma because that is the, that's the throw up zone. If you miss from there, all of the talk shows on Monday morning, people will be calling in about the kicker needs to be traded and he's a bomb and all of that. But if you always hit from 35 yards, you'll always punch up. Okay. Yes. We'll, we'll count on that. Wow. True story. A true story. I can think of one of them by name. Oh, what a cool thing to say. I genuinely love you both so much. I love your hearts and your humor and your humanity. You're beautiful people inside and out. Wow. Oh, I love cool Canood. Thank you, Canood. That is such a kind thing to say. Yes. Can you say scholarship? Yeah. I hope so. I, I think the kid's going to go far. I do too. Thank you, Stray. Last the, the, this last year, most of the NFL kickers couldn't kick 35 yard goal. It's the truth, a rough, rough year for it. I'm telling you that you, I don't think you realize just what a big deal he is. And by the way, for those of you wondering, he like legitimately kicks it soccer style and all that. Like he's this was not a poke and hope. This is a kid that can go out and do it, which is just yeah. You're right, Gronkowski level wizardry. There you go, Bills fan. Ooh. Yeah, too soon, too soon on me. <laughs> Sorry, I uh, I got I got completely sidetracked. I apologize. Okay, so before I wrap this up, a couple more questions. Number one, there's been a lot of people talking us uh, talking about um, us maybe uh, doing a um, a road trip. Now you're not playing with the with the with my affections. We're gonna go and uh, and meet some people and uh, and do what we did in Florida. Are we not? Oh, I really want to. It's 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 a goal for me. It's like a I want to make a career out of it. Yes. I, I would love to do that. I think that's what I said. Clearwater changed me. And then I went to Seattle and I met like 20 more people. And well, just and right the, after you did that, I did the same thing somewhere else. Yes. Right. I just so did the just, same thing. 
it's so energizing and it does something for the soul that I can't, I just can't quite meeting people in person is such a gift who it's yeah. I hope we do it. Yes, yes, yes. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. You're rocking the boat. I promise I would never do that. It's a really good song. It's a show tune. You're so you're so lucky I'm not busting into a show tune right now because I'm in the mood. Come to Wisconsin, says Yarn like Prepper. Crazy. I was singing like crazy on my last live. Uh, yeah, I'd love to go to Wisconsin. I've never been to Wisconsin. Do you know I keep your lives on in the background when I'm usually working on something else? And then someone will say something so dirty that I got to go over there and say something like, I'm sorry, did you just say Reese is taking her pants off? Or I'll say, did someone say boobs? But it's usually not because I'm sitting there waiting. It's usually because I'm doing something else and I've got it going in the background. Did you see that look? That was the I don't believe you. Talk my head to the side and look from one eye look. I recognize that. It was this one. I know that look. It's not I wasn't nice. giving you was, side was, eye. Was, you were. Back that up, no. people. Can someone verify the side eye? We were. Oh, I was no. talking about boobs. I did say I was going to take my pants off. It's because I was hot, but yeah. Yes you, yes, you are. But when I said that, you went, I'm telling you, I got the side eye. Silly squirrel. Good to see you. Glad you're here. Sean's wifey. Glad you're here. Um, this has been Laura Font, you are hilarious. This has been great, Tommy. I'm, I think we should do more serious subjects. I think you are perfect. I think you're a great interviewer. Um, I would love to interview you sometime. I may not have the, uh, quite the questions. I'll have to write stuff down. Speaking of, I would, uh, I would be fascinated. Huxley's working out without a shirt on. I've never seen this before. Son, I've never seen you without a shirt on. Look at your chest. That's the spirit. Wow. He said, it's hot in here. See, I was going to take my pants off. He took his shirt off. It's wow. Here. Is that from doing 200 push-ups a day? You have like definition in your chest. Listen oh to mom. God. She's so proud. Wow. Where's your look at, his, look at oh, your oh, ticket oh, oh. to the gun show. Holy cow. I had no idea. Wow, son. Oh, my, my cat God. Is chasing, my cat is chasing birds in her sleep. Oh, that's cute. That's so cute when they do that. Um, I want <laughs> you to know. Does. I I brought my white coat just for the record. I, oh, I did you? Because I I did. I I may I may have brought for. What are you doing? Know. This what are you is, taking your shirt off? What are you doing taking your shirt off? I was looking for my cat. I am. Uh, well, I was wearing a pearl. If I don't, oh. you thought I was taking an all off? No. I thought you were unclothing yourself. Did you say something no. about a coat? Just just because it seemed like a more appropriate way to end, right? I you know you didn't that, read uh, the super chats though. I'm going to. I intended to do them in as my polar self. And um, guess what? You see the color of my shirt? It's Sawanical across for all of my New York friends from Long Island. Look at the uh, but it's purple. Polar porn. Oh my God. You got your hat from John Shamwowski. Oh, Lord. Tell me this. Look, did it not look like it was planned? All right. So let's do these things. What do you like? Do, 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 do. You didn't tell me to get a cool hat, Tommy. That's not cool. I would have brought a, I would have brought my I, crown down or something. I thought that that pretty much goes without. I mean, like I actually had to say, get a, get a, a smooth hat. Isn't that a, isn't that a, like it should have gone without uh, without even needing to be said. Okay, hold on. We're going to start to stop. Parmeen, new member. Thank you so much. Mary Meltred, new member. Donna Wyoming says, come on. Why is it slow? Friend tax for Tommy. Oh, you know what? Friend. Oh, that's right. You were oh, it's an inside joke earlier. thing. You don't know what it's. Yes. Yeah, no, I, yeah. thought, I told you, you're on in the background at all times, Therese. I, 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 I am do. honored. Yeah, honor, get honor, stay honor. Wow. What? Uh, five mo Anna, thank you so much. Kathy loves horses. Hey, Reese and Tommy, love you both. Well, thank you, Tommy. I have to ask something. I'm kind of tired of mm -hmm. asking you out on dates. It's getting old. I kind of wish that you know maybe at some point you'd meet me in the middle here. But um, I already asked you the prom. That was bad enough. Do you think sometime that we could wear these coats and you could take me out on a date? 
I thought that that's what was happening on the uh, on the boat. But aren't we doing an official like? Uh, this is my problem. I'm sorry. I'm not doing the tops. I'm doing the uh, the pimp. Uh, I'm gonna have the big cane, right, and the hat. Right. I'm gonna put on a really pimpy watch with some some big gold. Uh, yeah. No. Say no more. Bernice Dooley, thank you so much. I'm going to throw that up on where the highlight you, reel. Where did you live when you were in KC? When you were in sent to KC, where you, I was in downtown Kansas City, so right close to the Oregon 36th and Broadway. Saving it all for the lights of Broadway. Relatable Reese. I listen to you all the time, and every time I do, I learn something new about you, and you never cease to amaze me. I was telling her the thank same you. thing earlier, was I not? Reese's channel can't hear Tommy. That sucks. I, I hope that you have figured that out, people. If not, I will just come back and do it all over again. You busy? We could just start at the top. Hey, everybody. This mm -hmm. is Captain Tommy Scuttle. You are on the light boat. We'll just start at the top. Chrissy mm -hmm. Newton. Let's give Reese as many hugs today to make up for all the good energy and connection she missed out on. That's what the that's what the fur was for. I'll be honest that is with so you. so kind, yes, Chrissy. You, you haven't lived until you have hugged a 200-pound polar bear that doesn't want to hurt you. Most it's... polar bears are not nice. Dennis from Boston. It's worse than I thought. Thank you for sharing this, Reese. Thank you, my Thank friend. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Reese, you are such a bright light. Even when you are struggling, you radiate goodness. Oh, oh, that's oh, so nice, Anne. It really is. And thank uh, you're welcome. I do like to keep things real. It's a gift. <laughs> Danielle Illuminati. Nice. Um, in November 2020, my boyfriend of four years passed from fentanyl. I'm so sorry. Um I'm sorry for your losses, uh, but also feel for Reese having to grieve the living. So much worse. It really is. I am sorry about your, uh, yeah, your boyfriend. Yeah, still, that's horrible about your boyfriend. Three, 350 people today overdosed and died. It sucks. But that's the that's the world we're in right now. Common, I can't imagine not seeing Reese on almost a everyday basis. So for me, Aaron, outing you was the best uh, thing to happen. I, I have said that too. I just would, I would have gone through a phase where I was, but you're a much nicer person than I am. I'm glad it happened. Do not get me wrong, but I would have wanted to do it. Melissa. Yeah. Uh, oh my God. Melissa, this is my OBGYN. She's going to answer all this of our food confusing. questions. This is confusing though. Cause you're always showing pictures of hot uh, doctor friends of yours. Which one is this? Uh, this is Melissa and she is a hot doctor friend. She's a OBGYN and she's going to talk about, um, our cooters and our cooter health. She's going to do it live with us about it. Um, so, can and, and cooter flaps. Yeah, you can definitely be there. So Melissa, I have got to get a hold of you. I, everybody is wanting this live. They miss you and we love you girl. Thank you. Yes. So better together. I think Reese's channel is your own personal protest to being silenced and controlled. F off into the forever yeah, is I enough. Her. I agree. Uh, you know what? I, that's the first time I think we've met. I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely a fan. Uh, absolutely. She is happy. And so are those of us who she has helped emotionally and mentally. Aww. I love her. I just went to lunch with her, Don in Wyoming. I'm jealous. You know Don in Wyoming. Yeah, it was great. Know, I wish you'd been there. Lunch. We talked a lot about you. Lies. Joe Virus, good to see you. Don in Love Wyoming. Love Joe Virus. I do too. Uh, from Kelly B69, Reese. How did you treat Hoxie? Yeah, I think we uh, I may have called this one out. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, we, we I'm had glad that. I did not put you, him in the org. No, he did not do services. Yeah, thank God. You two and Dr. Elizabeth Bates could do a live reaction video to one of Reese's early videos together so she doesn't walk this alone. You know what? I would be more than happy to do that with her. I would love that. Yeah. I love our good Dr. Elizabeth Bates. She's um, a therapist I've had on. She's amazing. She's become a very close friend. Nice. Hey, Chrissy over in Newton. Um, I'm so excited for you both. Uh, show hugs to Huxley. Um, I think that would be a solid uh, a solid idea i kind of like to hold a football for them to be really honest with you i'd see the good kick 
37 years of hugs to help your missing good energy. I love it. I absolutely love it. That's really it. nice. Thank you. I genuinely love you both so much. I put this one up because I think that was so cool. I love your hearts and your humor and your humanity. You are beautiful people inside and out. Oh, what a cool thing to say. I love Canood. Thank you. Yeah, I love that. I really do. Loved meeting you. Yes, I met her and she drove up from Portland. She drove four hours to meet me. Well, She's so I've amazing. Actually, I've never actually done the, the big travel thing to meet you, but um, I will in the future, I'm sure. I, I hope kind you of went to Florida to see you. I didn't kind technically of. know you were. I didn't technically you were in there when I uh, when I left to go there. But that's just a technicality. Yeah, but you that was amazing. Was that really worked out. That was really wild that we were there at the same time. That was well. What pretty was cool. wild was when I said to my friend, uh, I "said Oh man, I would have loved to have gone up there. I know it's a really long way." He's like, "No, it's not." You know, he's like, "No, no, we can get you up there." She. I wish you could see this. She's just swinging at me by accident. Every time she stretches, I'll show you in a minute. She's uh, she's really on one. Reese is one singular sensation. I think that may have been in reference to my, I know more show tunes than any straight man in history line. Pretty big fan of show tunes. Don't mock me. Don't judge me. Hello, Meryl West. Thank I love you Meryl. So much. Thank you, Meryl. Riding shotgun. Thank, Thank you. you. You are too kind. Marion Calabro. Love the name. Tommy, did you go to Sawanica High School? You grew up in Floral Park. Um, no, I did not go to Sawanica High, uh, High School. Um, my best friend did. My father oh, was cool. a, uh, my dad was an All-American lacrosse player from Sawanica High School. Went on to play uh, college. Uh, was a really amazing um Attack. This is actually uh, the old man's stuff. But uh, I know Floral Park. I know it well. And you know who else does? Our friend from uh, New York. Where is he? He knows Floral Park. We were talking about it the other day when we were down in Florida. Hey, hater, stuff this in your hat and you got to admit, it really does highlight the uh, Sawanica hat. Extreme Wesky. Elizabeth, Absolutely. you're hilarious. You've both made big differences in my life. What a beautiful thing to say. I a love her. She drove say. up from Portland. She's one that drove four hours to come up and meet me. What, a, what an absolutely humbling thing to say. It really is. Yeah. You know what She's this amazing. Is? Are you ready? Look at this. Hold on. Let me get it. Oh, That's so cute. She's Look at her little papa. <laughs> It's covering her eyes. Hold on. You know, I can do it this way too and get rid of me. And usually that makes. Uh oh. Yes, that's adorable. But um, we actually lost audio too. Oh my God. Uh oh. Okay. We lost our host. Oh, there he is. No, you didn't. I just scared the kitty and I had to take care of her. But that wasn't actually me. It was somebody that banged out there. Um, Reese, this was an honor. Sure was. It really was. We we clown a lot, but I really appreciate you taking the time to come on here and do this. I will. Uh, I owe you one. We'll have to uh, come over to your channel and crank up the um, the heat dialogue. Yeah, you'll you'll pay me back. You, you damn right. I, uh, you'll you get it. Word. Get it. Mm -hmm. Okay, guys. You. Seriously, I'm, this was amazing. Hmm? Yeah, this is I. I can't remember, you know, I, the, uh, when uh, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, I did a thing where I said, I, I don't want to talk about that piece of crap rapist anymore. Sorry, I don't. And uh, people said, well, you know, there goes all your views. I said, you know, I get a lot of views when I uh, hang out with Reese and given the uh, the choice of the two, I think I'd rather hang out with Reese. Well, I mean, just so you know, the feeling's mutual. Well, it's funny you say that. You two are just meant to be together as friends. You were both in Florida at the same time. You both reached 20,000 subscribers at the same time. And Tommy always pops in at the right time. How about that? Huh? That is such something. a good point. And you're all going to look right now for me because we've started doing this. And this really, really has become an issue. Check right now to make sure you're subscribed to Reese and to me. Because it is astounding. Right? My, my brother did a video on this earlier. 
right? And said, no notifications are going out, A, and B, they're not doing any of these things. And he picked up 77 subscribers on that video. And that's because they were all people who had been unsubbed. It's an over epidemic. Over 100. over 100 now from that video. But people who oh. all said, yeah, I've been unsubbed. Yeah, I've been unsubbed. Yeah, I've been unsubbed. Who else has a coat like that? Nobody. Just the two of us. Uh, you yeah. both look like a, uh, a, going out to a, a cafe for coffee and to talk about uh, philosophy life. And then the fur came out and the cafe got weird. That's what I love about you both. Perfect. And that We're going to go out right, in these it? coats. I want to go out and have a steak dinner in On this coat. Cruise ship. I'm telling you, when it gets really, really cold on the, uh, on the, what do they call that deck? I don't know. Don't say poop. I couldn't the tell other you. One. Yeah. Anyway, when we're, when we're walking. Yeah. Right. Late, late night, it gets very cool. cold on the deck of a uh, cruise ship. I promise it's you. It's going to be special. Gonna... Hey, there's Kai. Yes. Man, that's an excellent watch collection. Kai, you want me to bum you out? Check this out. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -do -do -do. New acquisition. Actually, he's a fan. He should he should enjoy this. This is the newest acquisition. Oh, it's a real watch? Do -do 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 -do. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. No, that is that is an Omega. There we go. It's a Speedmaster, and it's a triple date Speedmaster. He will appreciate mm -hmm. that. Sorry, okay. but he's a fan. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, the poop Kai, deck, yeah, it sounds bad. Yes, real Kai, connections really, really matter. You. So much love tonight. I love Kai. Thank you, Kai. I had a really good time with him. I really did. I did too. Uh, He's really a and good I'm guy. looking forward to meeting all of the rest of you. Question How long did you have a problem with math? A little over two years. That's, uh, that's a long time. It really is. The uh, end, I think. My, my theory on this, I do like my watches. My theory on this is that uh, you are dependent, not addicted, which is a good thing. There is, yeah. there is a difference. There is a difference. And the, the way that you walked away from it and the way that you don't seem to have a problem with any other substance normally would lead people to believe that. Yeah, you're probably would, dependent, self-medicating, but I don't think you're a drug addict. That's all right that we're not mad at you. You don't, you don't have to actually be a drug addict to hang out with us. Just makes it easy. Thank you for clarifying. Thanks. I was I'm concerned. Kidding. No, yeah. you're all right. You're well, you don't have right. to be a Scientologist to hang out with me. So, well, that's good, right? Yeah. Because I'm not joining. How long are those coats? Down to my hip. They just wanted to so, get yeah, a glimpse at you. It's far. They wanted too to see if you had pants on. I'm not wearing pants. Did, did everybody know? I'm not wearing pants. Um, Wait a minute. What are you wearing? A Matrix Rabbit. I have found Rolex is thrifting. You can. It does happen. Did, did you just you flash a knee? Hold on. What do you? What, 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 what do you have? What are you doing? What are you wearing? I need to know. I'm wearing. I'm wearing a fur coat and a uh, <laughs> and a shirt that says Solonic High School on it. So yeah. What's it's, underneath it would, that? It though? Been, nothing. It would have been way too. Uh, it would have been way, way too hot if I had had on pants for this. I had to go pantsless. I would show you, but then they would definitely um, demonetize the video. On that That's for our show. other channel. Inappropriate says now Reese's shake it Reese's. when you take it off. <laughs> yeah. Of course you did. Uh, we're going to set up <laughs> no, our other channel for that, boxers. if you remember. I don't, I don't wear boxers. You're going to be my Probably manager. Give for Mama my... Scoville back her coat. Do you, you have no idea who Mama Scoville is. This, this coat would fit five. Mama Scoville's. Mama Scoville's this big. She's not. Um, she's not a. She's not a tall woman. This is a very big coat for a very big dude. You know, this would. Uh, this would cover the infield at Yankee Stadium. Flashing the leg with a fur coat. I did. Yeah. I, I was. I almost went the uh, the Vin Diesel look from. Uh, from like um, what was it? Triple X. I was just going to come oh, in yeah. there bareback, bareback with it on. I should have flashed a foot. You know, we're going to save that for our other channel, though, Reese's Feetsies. And you're Reese's going to be Feetsies, my manager. Yeah, yeah you're going yep. to be my manager. Stay tuned, guys. There's more coming with Mama that. Scoville, Mama Scoville, to, to her defense, Mama Scoville is slightly taller than David Miscavige. But uh, but not by much. He got him by maybe a half an inch. He's wow. Not, he's not, uh, yeah, he's not, he's not a tall man. Him's a little but, but guy. But there's anything wrong with that. Not that there's no. anything wrong with that. He also Him's has very little. small hands. 
And from what I understand, yeah. smells like cabbage. Smells Ew. Like what I hear. It's a word on the tear. Guy smells mm. like cabbage. Get mad at okay. me. I didn't do it. Um, oh, you know what? This Thank is the Joe. one we're going to leave. This is the one we're going to leave with. Because I love that one. Boy, I'm telling you what, Miss Dragon. She says she may not be tall, but she can give you boys what for. Oh, yeah. No, we're scared absolutely crapless of her. For real. <laughs> we're, we're in our 50s and still scared of her. Yeah. Papa Scoville was 6'4", 280 pounds. We were all, always way more scared of Ma. But that's uh, Italian living. Definitely that's feels right. Yes. Yep. Love the I love that. Good. Guess what we're wearing on the cruise. What's that? Yes. I didn't know I we were going pantsless, though. Okay. I wish you would have told uh, me. First of all, like I'm pretty sure I texted that, but um, nevertheless, but no pants stands. No, I didn't know yeah. about that. Check your check your texts. You might even will. see a picture. Okay. Oh. <laughs> all right. I'm glad somebody got the Austin Powers reference. Thank you. All thank right. you. This was lovely, guys. Seriously, I want to say thank you, Tommy. You are a good host. You're a good interviewer. And, um, oh, I really enjoyed oh. this. I really enjoyed this. I love, love, love guys. Tommy and I talk all the time outside of YouTube and he is such a we close do. friend of mine now. And, uh, a day does not go by where I don't talk to him. So I am so glad we did this because it was kind of missing for us. And I would like to do more serious kind of healing content like that. I think it's necessary and, and people enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, this is this is really kind of in the wheelhouse for what we do. So it was, um, I, I thank you for coming on and doing this, you know, yeah. and uh, I will I will happily uh, come over and uh, and let you interview me. And I, you know what, truthfully, I, I have had the best interviews I've done without exception have always been from women. They just ask way different questions. Guys get super hung up on the whole convict thing. And that's. You end up talking about prison for, for three hours. And when you talk to women, it doesn't go that way. So I would look sure forward doesn't. to that, Reese. I really Not would. Not with me anyway. Well, good. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going I'm going to stay on for a minute because I have to ask you a question. Will you please not leave? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be right here. She makes it sound like I leave. I never leave. I'm going to be here. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Squirrel, don't go anywhere. Thanks, guys. To you Love you all. All right, people. You guys rock. Do 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 do.